one of his former lawyers, Laura Yaretsian, is with us live this morning to talk about these developments. And Laura, there's a lot going on after so much time. That's correct. I mean, the appellate process is usually very long. It takes years to get to this point. But it's a, the good thing here is that we have gotten to a point where there is truly uh, positive things happening in Scott Peterson's case. The, uh, the, uh, it is unfortunate, though, that the decision was made by the DA's office in Stanislaus County to proceed with the retrial of the penalty phase, especially when we're still waiting on a possible overturning of his conviction uh, uh, that will be decided by hopefully the November 13th, though San Mateo Court has time until then to make a decision and re-examine the conviction itself based on um, the misconduct by one of the jurors who uh, lied her way onto the jury, basically. So it's gonna be very interesting to watch and see what happens next. And let's talk about that juror. This is a woman who was pregnant, had some legal proceedings dealing with harassment from an ex and what have you. Why that particular situation, the fact that she didn't say she had those legal proceedings going on or had happened, why is that such a big factor in terms of changing things for Scott? Every defendant, I mean, it, it's the law in our country, uh, and it's an, a very important constitutional uh, right that defendants have. They're, they're entitled to a fair trial, and they're also entitled, entitled to have an unbiased, fair, neutral jury and jurors. So when we find out that one juror lied her way onto the jury panel and ended up on the panel that decided and convicted him, that's that's a big deal. And, and the fact that she hid uh, from counsel and from the court are material. I mean, very important facts. I mean, this this uh, juror happened to be four and a half months pregnant, and Lacey was pregnant when she disappeared. So she would have clearly connected and bonded with Lacey, and would have been very anti Scott. And also, she was in fear for the safety of her unborn child. And here we had an unborn child who was actually killed uh, when the mother uh, uh, died. So we, it's she'd been a victim of a crime, very important for her to have said, mentioned that. She not only had gotten a restraining order, but the, uh, the defendant in that particular case, the ex-girlfriend of her uh, boyfriend, was also convicted of vandalism. And these were very important facts that she, she should have been telling everybody openly, not kept to herself, but obviously she decided she was gonna get on that jury at any cost, including lying, um, just to get on because she had an agenda, an agenda to convict Scott Peterson. Um, and let's just talk about, I mean, a lot of this is very detailed, very confusing, but we're just talking about the death penalty sentence in Stanislaw County. The actual overturning potential for the conviction is happening in San Mateo County. Does that seem strange to you? I guess to a lot of lay people, it might seem like we need to address the conviction and overturning that, and then the other situation would be moot. Uh, it, it may be the second situation. I agree with you. The death penalty situation may be moot depending on what the court in San Mateo decides. If the court decides to overturn the conviction, if the court decides after re-examining that he didn't get a fair trial, that he didn't get what he was entitled, which was a fair jury, and the actual conviction is overturned, then yes, the what's going on in San Mateo County and the decision by the DA's office to retry him on the penalty phase, all of that becomes moot. But for now, we don't have any decisions yet from San Mateo Court, and uh, and since the pen death penalty um, retrial uh, proceedings are ongoing, basically the decision had to be made. But that's fine; they can make that decision. But we'll we'll have to wait and see what the San Mateo Court decides, and hopefully, it, they overturn the conviction and the penalty phase retrial becomes a moot point. And we are just almost out of time, but you felt from the very beginning that there never should have been a conviction in this case. Tell us one more time, you've been our guest before, tell us one more time why you feel that as uh, concisely as possible. Uh, clearly in this case, the, the whole case was, enti the entire case was based on circumstantial evidence. There was no forensic evidence whatsoever connecting Scott Peterson to the disappearance or the murder of his wife an unborn child, Connor. Uh, there, there was. I mean, there, the theory of the prosecution was really, honestly, I don't even know what their theory was because they couldn't even explain when this had happened, where it had happened, how it had happened, nothing. But there was so much hatred uh, against Scott Peterson 
uh, that a lot of the jurors went in just hating him. And many of them have probably made up their minds, and including juror number seven, who I can tell you may not have even been paying attention to what the defense counsel were presenting, especially that was very noticeable at one of the press conferences that was held after the conviction and the penalty phase was over. And you could tell she, she, she had so much hatred and that is not acceptable. Jurors have to be fair. Every defendant is entitled to fairness. And in this case, the evidence was not sufficient, but hatred just blinded people and got him convicted. Alrighty, thank you so much for your time this morning. We really appreciate you. You're welcome.